Hi, uh, this is Paul Arts. I'm the project leader of Zaytun Academic Exchange. It's a program which uh, tries to bring students together, students from different nationalities, different backgrounds, to learn each other and to make them understand each other better. We started the program uh, more than two decades ago uh, with an exchange program with Iran and uh, after that we developed the same kind of exchanges with uh, Yemen, northern Iraq and Syria and the latest addition is uh, Morocco which we just started a new exchange uh, program with. So far we think we did a very good job bringing uh, very different kind of students together um, out of which sometimes nice friendships uh, came forward and uh, at any rate we think uh, it has a bright future um, for the coming uh, years. This is uh, Marlene Henny speaking. Uh, I'm the head of the Moroccan delegation of the Zitun project of 2012 and 2013. Uh, the Zitun project was an initiative from the University of Amsterdam, um, as Paul Arts mentioned in the previous interview, uh, to bring students together from different cultures. Um, the project is called Zitun because the olive uh, is a symbol of peace and goodwill uh, from the ancient European. Uh, Middle Eastern and North African cultures. Uh, during the Zitun project, uh, the students had the occasion to meet uh, government officials, uh, ambassadors, uh, have lectures uh, on several topics um, like uh, politics, uh, economy and society. And the main theme of the Zitun project was democracy and democratization. Uh, through this project, uh, we managed to bring 20 students together uh, to understand each other and to discuss the important topics on political science and international relations. The Zitun project uh, contributed to uh, many changes of the lives of our students uh, and hopefully uh, for other students uh, in the near future. Uh, besides my own passion of bridging cultures, uh, the Zitun project was a perfect occasion uh, to bring the Moroccan and Dutch culture together, to let uh, young students discuss uh, important topics um, and to bring the two cultures closer to each other. In February 2013, 10 students from the University of Amsterdam traveled to Rabat as part of the Zeitung Academic Exchange Program. Both a cultural experience and a scientific endeavor, they tried to answer the question, what is the democratic status of Morocco? To answer this question, we split up in three different subgroups. One was focused on the nature of the state, one on the civil society, and another on the Moroccan economy. Even though we studied our subject beforehand, we came home with some interesting eye-openers regarding the democratic project in Morocco. We went to Morocco to do a research on the functioning of the state as an agent for democratization. To gather our data, we attended lectures and visited different kinds of organizations in Morocco. On the first day, we attended an impressive lecture by Professor Moudin at École de Gouvernance et d'Économie. He presented a clear image concerning the functioning of the Moroccan state and how it worked against the implementation of democracy in Morocco. Uh, I have been, like many political scientists uh, or those who are interested in Morocco, who have been obsessed with the question that, uh, or with the phenomenon that things don't change in this country. But Morocco doesn't change. What we found interesting and confusing was that he left out the position of the king. As a matter of fact, we encountered the same problem during our other visits. No one wanted to put Mohammed VI in bad light. So for the first few days we had problems with asking questions because we were too focused on the king. Luckily, we were able to get past our focus on the king and got real answers on our questions. This realization helped us during the interviews with the political parties. Our meeting with some of the biggest parties in Moroccan politics, Istiklal, PGD, UVSP and PAM, was very fruitful. It gave us an insight about the workings of Moroccan politics and especially the link between the Maxen and the parties who govern the country. On one of our last days, we met up with multiple anti-corruption organizations who are trying to address the clientelistic systems in Morocco. 
They were quite vocal, and we were surprised by the success the organizations have in the Moroccan society. However, the question remains... I got the impression, if I may say so, that uh, your organization is quite technocratic and not political. Um, would it be possible that your organization is being used or being seen as a fig leaf for the openness of the Moroccan political system, look what we have, evaluation commission, blah, 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 but that, in fact, it is not really acting as a watchdog as it maybe should be. Nevertheless, we left Morocco less skeptic and with a broader view of the Moroccan political actors. There are definitely more dynamics in Moroccan politics than meets the eye. One of the other key topics of our research was the link between Moroccan politics and economy. We especially focused on economic liberalization. As Dr. Moudin explains, reform can be both the cause and the effect of regime change. More specifically, this means that economic liberalization can lead to democratization and the other way around. It also means that a liberal economy thrives best in a democratic environment. In the case of Morocco, privatization began in the 1980s. Although some reforms have occurred, a democratic deficit still remains. In the end, our findings suggest that liberalization never fully took place in Morocco. Although there have been liberal economic changes and the Moroccan private sector is relatively free in many sectors, the economic actors were limited in their contribution to the process of democratization. During our stay in Morocco, we visited the Bouregek project, which we consider a good example of this. It's a project to redevelop the area surrounding the Bouregek river in Rabat. Its ultimate aim is to attract more tourists and foreign investments. The project is a public-private cooperation, but the state is the leading actor and dictates the terms, limiting the room for private incentives. Civil society is often seen as a key pillar of democratic governance. Civil society provides a forum for citizens who share certain political interests and can be a potential vehicle for democratization. But what role does civil society play in Morocco? What is civil society in Morocco like and what is the relationship between the Moroccan civil society and the state? Uh, and that is also that something that you said earlier, that you, for some things you don't want to write about because you feel like you insult people. And you might hurt people, and I well, very much respect that, that point of view, which we miss sometimes in Holland. But if I were to come to a doctor, and he examined me, if the doctor were to think, ah, oh, I have some bad news, but I don't want to hurt him, would you want the doctor to tell you you have a disease? And um, and my other question is, do you feel like you're maybe working in a hospital where it's not always possible to tell your patients what's going on? And how do you feel about that personally? Our first impression was that the Moroccan media imposed quite a lot of self-censorship. When visiting Has Press, a major Moroccan online newspaper, we tried to find out more about freedom of speech and the role of media in Morocco. Here we are in Hash Express building. I so I was wondering, do you, with your strong position and with your followers, um, do you put pressure on the government to change the uh, current situation? Uh, or will you do it in the future? The media mission is now to deal as a political power, is to control, to observe and to give a clear idea about what's happened in the streets. In between the lectures and visits to organizations, we also had time to discuss the capacity of civil society with the Moroccan students. However, we were still not sure about the independence of the civil society in Morocco and whether it could operate freely under the watching eye of the king. Looking at the state of politics, economy and civil society, we found that Morocco still has some important democratic deficits. However, we also noticed a lot of commitment to the democratic ideal among Moroccans, and especially the youth. Do you want to know more about the state of democracy in Morocco? Read our research report, the website of Zaytun Academic Exchange, www.zaytun.org. Zaytun program gives students the opportunity to exchange their culture and get to know more about the other. It includes a deep and mutual understanding of the state of democracy and civil society. After 10 students from UVA came to Morocco with a partnership with EGE, 10 Moroccan students joined the Netherlands with the same motivation and willingness to learn. During the 10 days, 
we met with scholars, officials, representatives of NGOs and political actors in order to give us a new vision of Dutch democracy. As an introduction, we had an overview of national and local politics in the Netherlands. David Laws put the emphasis on local politics and its complementary role besides a national political scene disconnected from daily life of the citizens. So, and there it was how people's anger is shaped, how their frustrations with the government are shaped and how the targets of those anger develop. But you could also say the same thing about their sort of experiences of democracy are shaped, right? So that, that what, and the claim that they were making is that these aren't shaped in the abstract, but they're shaped in the sort of face-to-face, -face, very immediate, very concrete interactions that the public, members of the public have with people from government. And I, think I think you see a lot of energy there that suggests people may be frustrated with conventional ways of approaching things. They don't feel that they get at what's important to them. They might not feel um, fully represented. They might feel that, the, that politics in The Hague is a long way from uh, the kind of street-level politics that really interests and engage them. Um, and, 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 and you see this probably across the board, but certainly where um, people's sense of the political is much more connected to uh, everyday life let's say, um, and the kind of politics of everyday life, and whether that's, um, you know, plans for the redevelopment of our neighborhood or uh, for building a big project that's going to impact us and how we get engaged, how our ideas, but also our concerns about that um, are either engaged by the process, we get the opportunity for voice, we feel supported in those efforts, or whether they're marginalized or channeled into maybe regular sorts of processes, what's called Inspraak here, that allow people sort of an opportunity to speak, but not much opportunity to be heard. Fatima al Atir confirmed what David Laws explained. Local politics has to be close to citizens. The ideal way of doing local politics of, of, or local governing is to do it with people. And the main focus is the participation of your citizens within the political system, and not just within the political system, but also within the ideas and the subjects and also the issues in the political system. And that demands a government that's very locally organized, locally based, with local authorities to really just not, not just to know what's happening, but also to have the authority to implement and change things. Dutch political scene is known to be based on consensus. We could experience that by a simulation of the talks on a social agreement where students had to play the role of ministers, trade unions representatives and private entities. We have learned that negotiating and debating is a must to reach agreements, but it is always difficult to obtain a general consensus with the pressure of other forces like the European Union. However, representatives of political parties share different opinions on the role the European Union is supposed to play and how far Dutch people can give up sovereignty. Should we give up more sovereignty? We have made those decisions. We already took that decision when we said there's going to be a single European market for workers, for labor. We did that when we decided that there was going to be a single European market for goods and services. When we decided the 17 Eurozone, uh, EU countries that adopted the Euro, we already gave up our sovereignty when it came to things like national control over certain economic matters. And the point is now that there are problems and these problems need to be solved. The meeting with the mayor of Rotterdam has shown that the balance between the minority and the majority is still possible. Democracy is a very easy thing. It's based on one man, one vote. That the most 
which was the principal. Then, after that, uh, a majority is needed to govern. And then, parliament is taking control. And then, you build up your own institutions. That can be different, how to organize your institutions. You have one chamber, two chambers, a uh, system. Um, directly elected, partly not directly elected, all these things are possible. But the very fundamental things in democracy are not, not complex. Uh, one man, one vote, honestly voting, uh, the majority part of the taking control, and that's it. Many issues are still at stake within the Dutch democracy, such as the question of integration of minorities and communities. Overal in Europa gaan de lichten langzaam uit. Overal op het continent waar onze beschaving bloeide en waar de mens vrijheid, welvaart en cultuur schiep. Overal ligt het fundament van het Westen onder vuur. Overal in Europa fungeren de elites als beschermers van een ideologie die al 14 eeuwen lang uit is op onze vernietiging. Met als inzet de voortzetting van de massa-immigratie en de islamisering, uiteindelijk resulterend in een islamitisch Europa. Griet Wilders is een right extremist politician. En of course, his opinion does not represent the majority's opinion. But this reveals how media in Netherlands are liberal and guarantee a very broad freedom of speech where the notion of red lines has few restrictions. I don't agree that there are no red lines. I, I only say that these red lines are very, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're very they're liberal and, and, and they're flexible and they should be only in very clear cases. Dutch democracy is often perceived as a model. However, it is a hereditary regime where the chief of state is not elected. I know that democracy means separations of power. You know, if some, some, some basic element of democracy is the separation of powers. Of uh, and that is for the public, for the kingdom. Separation of powers is, in my opinion, a central element when we talk about uh, uh, democracy. At the end of the program, students got the opportunity to interview their peers to have an external point of view on their own country and its democracy. Here are some of their conclusions. So, uh, after this visit to Holland, what do you think, uh, in what way do you think that civil society matters for the democracy in the Netherlands? Uh, well, I said that I, in my in my opinion, I think that Netherlands is a democratic state. However, uh, we have there, there are some limits, and what uh, what impressed me is the level of uh, freedom, liberty in Le Netherlands. So the game art is uh, legal. You are free to talk uh, about whatever you want, and I think it's um, it's really important. And uh, I would like to see uh, more freedom in Morocco. So if we look at the state of democracy in Morocco, we can, in my opinion, you can say that Morocco is no democracy at this moment. Because um, if you take a look, for, uh, for, for example, to the separation of power, um, it might be in the constitution, like it's written, but it's not being implemented. Um, the king still is, the central, uh, is still in the center of power and doesn't... Um, really is affected by the power of the opposition, by the power of the judges, by the power of um, the government. He is the one who makes up the, who, who makes up the uh, policies, he's the one who implements them. 
and in the end he's also the one um, being the biggest earner of all those policies. So that's my opinion about the state of democracy. So. In my opinion, in Netherlands, democracy is intrinsically linked to the state who, in a certain way, uh, protects the separation of power. And, and the conclusion that I can make is um, the separation of power exists and democracy exists and freedom of speech and democracy protect in a certain way uh, uh, min minorities and uh, majority and also um, um, the existence of freedom of speech with a few red lines um, makes uh, um, uh, a system of, of Netherlands uh, a model for, for Morocco. Well, uh, in Morocco, and, but actually not, not necessarily only in Morocco, I think more broadly everywhere, also in the Netherlands, I believe that civil society does not necessarily have to be a positive thing. Civil society can also be uncivil, mm -hmm. and um, I think we as scholars, academics, uh, and also uh, those that are interested, interested in politics, sometimes overestimate the role of civil society as a, necessarily a positive thing. And then, more specifically, in the Moroccan context, I remember a uh, presentation by Rashid Tutu, in which he described that uh, the so-called proximity approach, uh, in which he described that there was a centrality of the king when it comes to the workings of civil society, mm -hmm. and that there was actually a competition between uh, the king and the civil society organizations. And that competition was highly asymmetrical. And I think that uh, this allows civil society, if they are then necessarily civil in some cases, to uh, actually be the democratic counterweight. And that has to do with the fact that the king has in some cases taken over the civil society discourse and focuses more on poverty alleviation by, mm -hmm. for example, uh, uh, symbolically giving Hari Rasuk to the poor. Mm -hmm. Well, in essence, this could also be a job done by civil society organizations themselves. But they are shifting more to human rights and democracy now. And, and that creates not a level playing field. They're both focused on different things, uh, but the king uh, is highly focused on the poverty alleviation part, if I understood uh, Rashid Tutu correctly. And uh, I find that an interesting thing, because that means that this proximity approach Im impedes on, uh, on the state of democracy through civil society in Morocco. All right. Um. Well, the second question would be uh, from the Dutch and uh, for me also the Moroccan uh, civil society perspective. Uh, what would you like to see more in Morocco and what probably I would like to see more in the Netherlands? Mm. What, what I would like to see more in, or what I find a virtue maybe in, in, in the case of Morocco is um, the fact that, that still the, the, there is still also the existence of this traditional civil society. Um, and it's not promoted as, for example, modern civil society is, but I believe that um, in many cases more local initiatives are good and can, uh, in a time of globalization in which we have an own idea of uh, democracy in the West, where we sort of export it globally. It would be really good to find local initiatives and local ways that um, are strong with traditional way of, uh, that, that connect to the, tr tr to the traditional civil society. And I also believe that it would be a great thing for if, uh, if that would be in the Netherlands. And um, if, if more local initiatives, small, small projects uh, will arise.